<clears throat> okay, hello. Um, so today we'll talk about two um, creators, an architect and an engineer, but an engineer who was deeply himself an architect. Uh, that is Felix Candela, and we'll talk also about uh, Eugène Violet Le Duc. We'll begin with a Frenchman, so born in 1814, uh, and uh, he died in 1879, so at 65. Uh, Eugène Emmanuel Violet Le Duc um, was a French architect and author who restored many prominent medieval landmarks in France including those which had been damaged or abandoned during the French Revolution. His major restoration projects included Notre Dame de Paris, the Basilica of Saint-Denis, which was the beginning of the, of the Gothic times, the first building that asserted the Gothic, Mount Saint-Michel, Saint-Chapelle, and the medieval walls of the city of Carcassonne. And he planned much of the physical construction of the Statue of Liberty. Liberty enlightening the world. Now, this is uh, something I myself forgot. I did read about it, but I forgot. His later writings on the relationship between form and function in architecture had a notable influence on a new generation of architects, including Victor Horta, Hector Guimar, Antoni Gaudi, Hendrik Petrus Perlache, Louis Sullivan, and Frank Lloyd Wright. What a what a short list of, 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 of great architects. So this was the man. Uh, an excellent uh, architect, although some people uh, consider him controversial. But I have to say that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, recommended his son, who was an architect too, one of his sons, to read only one book. And that was um, uh, the, the Encyclopedia of the, of, me of the Medieval World by, by uh, uh, Eugène Viollet-le-Duc. Uh, it's not a little thing because, um, because uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was not so fond of Europe. And uh, yet he recommended his son to, to read this book. And indeed, it is a... <laughs> It is an astonishing book. I mean, if this man would have would have done nothing else but that book, then he would have deserved to 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 be you know on the list of, of you know great achievements in human history. Uh, but it was something about the 19th century. It was this quest for totality, for wholeness. You know, it was uh, it was a century obsessed in a way with uh, totality. Yes, with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with various fields to bring them together because in that book, this man drew everything and I'm going to show some of his drawings there. I mean, he drew not just buildings, but also uh, military equipment and uh, attires, you no know, clothing and uh, potteries and the objects, everything, everything that he imagined constituted the, the medieval world. I like the way he looks, you know, like a man who didn't uh, throw a shadow on this earth for nothing. You know, a serious man, uh, you know, a poet in his way, you know, with with a coat maybe, I mean, I'm sure handmade and with a beautiful, made of a beautiful clothes. But you can tell that he was, you know, a little bit, uh, he, he didn't look like, a, you know, a, a playboy architect. Uh, although, he was French, and uh, you know, like here, he looks a little bit more uh, assertive. I like him, Violet Le Duc, 19th century. I think figures like him inspire us. That's why I keep telling to the students, get inspired by important figures in architecture. They warm up your spirit, your heart. They inspire you. Don't go through, you know, uh, don't go through architecture without having some, some mentors, you know, some inspirational figures. Now, I mean, did uh, architects usually have a big ego and uh, it's possible he had it too. I mean, why is he here in the, 
in the corner of this, uh, you know, part of a building, I guess, because of it. But this was, you know, this was done also by painters. You know, they included sometimes themselves because they put all their life into what they were doing. Now, maybe you can also do try something like this in your, in your own project. Imagine making a project in school where you include, you know, in, maybe in a rather shadowy place in a house or a, even a hotel with five, five stars, in a room or in the corner or somewhere on the corridor or in the hallways, put a, a sculpture, you know, just like here with your own head. <laughs> And you don't even have to tell the professor about this, but you know you did it. And as I said, he also depicted himself uh, on the roof of Notre Dame de Paris, who arrived there. Drawings, drawings by Violet Le Duc. Now these were engraved, not by him, but uh, he did the drawings. I look at the structure of this. Uh, but he drew incessantly. I mean, this man drew and drew and drew. The, his books because he published many, not just the one I mentioned, which is in itself a whole world. But um, he loved to draw. But it's not just drawing, it's not, it's not, it's not just rendering, it's a form of thinking through drawing. But the drawings are very meticulous, and these were not done with, uh, you know, Revit or uh, I don't know what. They were all done by hand. I mean, just this drawing, imagine doing just this drawing, and he has thousands and thousands and thousands of drawings. Violet Le Duc. No wonder Frank Lloyd Wright recommended him to his son, to his own son. He didn't recommend him Neufert. Well, Neufert was not born at that time. But do, do you know that Ernest Neufert actually studied at the Bauhaus? And not only that, Neufert loved Antoni Gaudi. Very, very interesting, if you ask me. Gothic, neo-Gothic, of course. It, in the 19th century, we had a neo-Gothic uh, and a lot of metal work here, iron, you know, but uh, the inspiration was the Gothic. Castles. Uh, as I said, you know, this man drew everything. <laughs> I mean, just to make this drawing, it will take you a little bit of time now to make it so in, people would not laugh at you. He was obsessed by the medieval world. I told you, you know, he also did, uh, you know, drew uh, potteries and everything. The whole of life interested him, not just architecture. I guess this is his signature here. It's like a, you know, uh, cryptic uh, signature, you know, like a symbol, like a, like a, uh, an emblem. Yeah, here too. And then the person here is the one who did the engraving based on the drawing of the master. But, uh, you know, the drawing itself, Again, it requires some work, furniture, everything. This man drew everything. We saw that one. I mean, look just at this machinery, a war machine, it's, or whatever it is. It's very intricate and very complex. It seems working. It seems it works. And I imagine it does. So it's not just uh, you know, a drawing to fool us. Vida e obra, <laughs> life and, uh, and oeuvre, or uh, work. Anyway, we'll arrive. Architectural restorer. He restored many things. Was a pupil of uh, Leclerc, but was inspired in his career by the ar architect Henri Labrust, an excellent French architect uh, who, who, who built um, two great... Um, uh, libraries, uh, and uh, he deserves to be known too. In 1836, Violet Le Duc, he traveled to Italy, where he spent 16 months studying architecture. Back in France, he was drawn irrevocably to Gothic art. 
la super strain Viollet le Duc as a medieval archaeologist on the restoration of Saint Germain l'Auxerrois. So the main restorations, Bezelay Abbey, France, a beautiful um, church there, which I had I had uh, the, the 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 luck to actually see, Holy uh, Chapel uh, in Paris, Notre Dame. City Wall of Carcassonne in France, Pierrefonds Castle in France, reconstruction for Napoleon III. Viollet le Duc let his imagination run to rebuild his, this castle near in the north of Paris. Viollet le Duc restorations frequently combine historical fact with creative modification. To restore an edifice, he observed in the Dictionnaire Raisonné is not to man maintain it, repair or rebuild it, but to reestablish it in a complete state that may never have existed at a particular moment. Now, some, some people criticize him for this because he took liberties, creative liberties, that, uh, you know, less, uh, you know, audacious people considered uh, even outrageous. But it was the creative Viollet le Duc. You know, he asserted his time. He, he, he couldn't build like in the 12th century. He built like the, in, in the 19th century. So eight centuries passed between the, um, you know, the 11th century and the 19th century. And he had no problem to uh, incorporate the new into the flesh of the, of the old. And some people protest to this, but I think it's the correct attitude. I mean, life goes on. You can't just keep things of the past, you know, in a glass cage and then, uh, you know, uh, completely uh, divorced from, from here now, from the time we are in. I don't think that's the, the correct, uh, the correct uh, interaction with, with the past. Basilica Maria Magdalena in Vesele, now this is a, a formidable work, and uh, I don't know exactly. He worked on the fa on the facade. Le let's read. During the French Revolution, the ancient monastery buildings were destroyed and sold at, at, at auctions. Only the basilica, cloister, and dormitory escaped demolitions. After the revolution, Vézelay stood in danger of collapse. The church was in a sorry state, as shown in a watercolor by Viollet le Duc, who was integral to the design of architectural practice. Arches, chapped, cracked walls, turn left, west facade collapsed, uh, uh, etc. Immediate, I don't know. He began the restoration project and extends its bad translation until 1859. I had been inside the, this, this church. Uh, Violet Le Duc rebuilt much of the building, especially the flying buttresses and arches, and restored the west facade, which is the, the entrance facade into, into the cathedral or into the church. The west front, a combination of Romanesque, Gothic, and 19th century work, originally built around 1150 in the Romanesque style, it was given a Gothic central gable and south tower in the 13th century. Much of this was heavily restored in 1840 by Viollet le Duc, who, was, who also added the Romanesque style tympanum of the Last Judgment to the central portals. Now, I, I'm not sure that in our time uh, on, on churches, uh, in churches, on cathedrals, in cathedrals, the Last Judgment is is still, um, you know, depicted. But if it is not, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a sad loss. Anyway, this is the watercolor he did. And uh, this is how the, the building looks like uh, uh, now with the, with the facade, the, the entrance facade uh, restored. But uh, there are some remarkable uh, sculptures here um, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this church. Uh, here they are, and I think they uh, they are by uh, one of the few sculptors uh, whose name came down to us from the uh, you know the 12th century, perhaps I don't know exactly, or 13th century. Gisli 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 Bertus, or Gisli Bertus, a formidable sculptor, and this is by him. 
uh, even more formidable are his sculptures at, uh, in Autun, another church not far away from another little town or village uh, close to Vézelay. I mean, these are fascinating, you know, these depictions of, uh, you know, the doomed human being. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, like, for example, here is we have the Le Bon Dieu, God, in the center. And then we have on one side, you know, the penitent and, the, you know, the uh, people who are sorrow in a way. And then you have scenes from, uh, from uh, you know, from hell. These churches in France are, are extraordinary, and they have so many. And it's, you know, like um, Violet Le Duc also restored uh, Saint Denis, which apparently initiated, announced the arrival of the Gothic into the world. And uh, um, there, there are many kings of France that are, are buried. Uh, it, this it's it's an incredible treasure that that that, that France has. And this is how how the church looks now, looks like like now. And when you think about it, I mean, when I was there, I didn't know that actually Violet Le Duc restored this Western facade. Uh, it impressed me very much, even if it's a newer newer elevation. I mean, he did some restorative work, but. Uh, um, I don't know. I don't know it, to what extent he created a new a new elevation or not. But it still looks very impressive and uh, it's something magical. I, I I regret we don't build cathedrals in this way any longer, and we don't. Uh, I mean, we are building a cathedral right now in Bucharest, but uh, I don't think it has the nobility of Saint Chapelle, Paris. Yes, he loved the Gothic, and it is shown, um, you know, in, uh, in in everything he did. The Gothic was perhaps the last. Uh, at least this is what uh, an Indian uh, uh, scholar uh, said, um, Kumaraswamy, uh, who stated that in the Gothic times, in the medieval times, Europe achieved for the last time, or maybe. For 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 the single time when it 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 it, appro it it was similar kind of to the achievements of Asia, you know the the temples of India, uh, uh, for example, where a collective aspiration for uh, for the above for the divinity was shown through architecture through temples in this case through a, a chapel through a church. And after the Renaissance, of course, there was still uh, a lot of human genius, but it was not collect collective any longer. It was individual. You know, you had uh, Leonardo, you had, well, he didn't be Leonardo, but in terms of art, uh, Michelangelo, Raphael, uh, Brunelleschi, and so on. You had individuals. In the med medieval times, there were anonymous works. There are very few names that came down to us, but the buildings they built were incredible. Plus, at the beginning, the Gothic was considered um, an aberration, was considered uh, the work of barbars, a barbaric work. Uh, at least even Raphael considered the Gothic in these terms, but I don't think it is so at all. It just represents a... a, a uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, a faith that after the Renaissance people didn't have any longer. This collective faith, these buildings were built for God. And people died maybe happily, maybe happily contributing to a work which didn't claim their names. They didn't care about names. They cared about building for God as well as possible. And these are works done in stone, as you know. I mean, <laughs> now what technology did they have? What, what they had is what we don't have. 
an incredible faith. But we don't have it any longer, so we have to become existentialists, uh, agnostics, uh, atheists, and whatever, and take aspirins and go to Dr. Freud. Because we don't build this. <laughs> I, I truly feel that these builders who contributed to, 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 this, to this building and such buildings, they didn't need so much therapy. I'm sure their lives was difficult. I'm sure it was difficult, but but they found uh, meaning in life by by creating by being a small part of this um, edifice, this uh, this uh, symphonic work. I lived for a while in France, not a long time, exactly because I wanted to be so-called in, in the shadow of the big cathedrals. They always attracted me. Maybe it comes because I am from Sibiu and there I also lived as a child in the shadow of the evangelical church in the center of the old town. And I'm connected with the Gothic uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a deep way, I think. I love the Gothic. Notre Dame in Paris, Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Uh, this is an old picture. Um, we know what happened to, to it. Uh, I read that actually, I don't know if it's true, but I read rather recently that uh, the wife of the president of France, Ms. Monsieur Macron, said that uh, Something like this, I couldn't believe it, that, that she wanted to destroy the, the existing cathedral and to have it rebuilt in the, in, in the shape of a giant phallus with um, golden testicles. Can you believe it? That's what I read. <laughs> it looked like a serious website. I forgot where I read. Um, it's possible. I had another idea because it preoccupied me. I said like this, because I know, I know, I know where this cathedral is. You know, in front of, of uh, Cathedral Notre Dame is the so-called Point Zero in Paris, the zero point from where all the distances in the city start to be measured. It's right there in front of the cathedral. And I had a feeling that, okay, this building is, is uh, offered for its destined, is, um, is, is, is for uh, Marie, no, uh, Jesus' mother, for the sacred, for Marie, Notre Dame, uh, Our Lady. But I had a feeling that in France, in France, there are actually two ladies that need to be honored. One is Marie, the mother of Jesus, and the other one is Marianne. Who was Marianne? Marianne was the lady the woman who uh, in front of the revolutionaries in the French Revolution, and you probably saw that painting by Delacroix, a woman with bare breasts who, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, a flag, you know, in front of the revolutionaries, uh, inspiring the revolutionaries. So while Mary, the mother of Jesus, stands for, you know, the mother of Jesus, Marianne stands for uh, justice, for uh, equality, for liberté, égalité, fraternité. So I even wrote the text, and in fact, I, I, I could relaunch it, uh, a competition to imagine a building for Marianne in front of the building by, uh, for uh, Marie. So in front of the cathedral uh, Notre Dame, to have a building, a modern building, uh, to express the... the, the, the you know, the, the, the energy of the French Revolution and to be dedicated to Marianne. And what was very interesting when I wrote this text, when it was actually, I think, 800 years in that year since the founding of the cathedral, you know, the beginning of the construction, exactly then when I was th thinking about these two, you know, feminine uh, figures, Two women were fighting for becoming the mayor of Paris. It just happened. It was like a synchronicity, a simultaneity. 
and one of them won. And even now, Paris has a, a lady, a woman, who is the mayor of, 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 of Paris. But I, I received one project for the, I did launch it, but not more rather tentatively. Anyway, because I think the sacred, in the absence of the, uh, you know, the, the life as lived here on the earth, is uh, inadequate. We need both. And that's why we need both ladies. You know, Marianne, who stands for Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, and Marie, the mother of Jesus. The sacred and the profane face to face. That was the idea. Sorry for this uh, long uh, digression. Now here is the T square of Monsieur Violet Le Duc, and that is supposed to be his hand. Uh, but I don't know why I don't have another picture. I hope I, I come back to it. Uh, what is written there? I don't know. Uh, to my shame, uh, Latin. I mean, I studied Latin in, uh, in school, but. Nothing, nothing remained with me. Anyway, that this is a fragment of uh, of the statue representing uh, Violet Le Duc on top of the roof of Notre Dame, a drawing by him. I mean, just this drawing, you know. Uh, this is a view before the flash, the spire that Violet Le Duc built, and I'm glad he built it. Uh, other pictures. Um, I think the Gothic is impressive. I, I, I can't understand why people don't, some people uh, think it's, it's uh, some people thought. I mean, even Raphael, who was supposed to be a very sensitive man, no, I'm talking about the great Renaissance master. He thought it was a barbaric uh, uh, Here you see, this is Violet Le Duc. Now, I don't know if it, this is a T-square. I think it is a T-square. And, you know, the architect... Uh, uh, positioned himself right here, but these th things came down now with a with a terrible uh, fire that happened there. The gargoyle is also his work, and you see the presence of the devil or the presence of the dark ones. You know the uh, yeah the dark ones is important for the gothic spirit, but uh, in today's uh, building of, uh, of uh, sacred buildings, often we forget about the dark side and we don't touch the, you know, the subject of the last judgment and we don't include, can you imagine in Bucharest, for example, on the facade of the uh, new cathedral that they, they build now, uh, something like this, impossible. We only think in terms of angels and only in terms of, uh, you know, light and, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, peace in a way, but everything is is dialectical. You cannot have light without darkness. You cannot have the angel without the other side. You know, Lucifer. You can the fallen angel and and these gargoyles. I think they are very very expressive. They in in a way they represent the suffering that life is and is for all of us which the modern, the contemporary church, at least uh, around me here now, uh, doesn't want to acknowledge. Here he is, here he is. Hello, Monsieur Violet Le Duc, happy birthday to you. Well, you know, it happened yesterday, but um, yeah, this is Violet Le Duc. I mean, uh, he was on top of, of the <laughs> Cathedral Notre Dame, but uh, he will come back to it, I'm sure. So please remember, dear students and architects, when you build buildings, don't forget to add your profile somewhere in the attic or somewhere. Do something. You know, it's important, I think. A little bit of an, um, you know, ego, ego trip or egocentric uh, reincarnation of yourself in the form of, in some form, but it could be even abstract, abstracted, yeah. <laughs> Lapsi de Notre Dame by Charles Marion. Now here I have a, an interesting story to tell you if you have the, the patience to hear it. This is an engraving from 19th century by this engraver, uh, Charles Marion. And here it is. And uh, you see it's before uh, Violet Le Duc built, uh, uh, built uh, his, uh, his uh, spire. 
And <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I should engage you uh, in hearing this story. Okay, I will very quickly, but it, it, it's, it's really an anecdote. But it happened to me. I was in New York City and I was penniless and I was, I was, I was depressed. I didn't have a job and I, 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 I needed desperately some money. So I went to an auction a Tepper Gallery, and I saw this engraving, this exactly this etching uh, being sold. And it was estimated together with another one by Rembrandt, but that one I knew it was a forgery, uh, uh, together $100. And I, I, I had the feeling this must be much more expensive. So I went to the New York Public Library and I did some research and I learned that this, this work, exactly this work by Charles Merriot, sells for about $3,000. So because I was desperate, I called a friend. I said, Aaron, please lend me $500. And uh, after some negotiations, he agreed. He gave me the money. I went to the auction and I won it. But I won it at 500. And immediately after I won it, I felt uh, someone touch my shoulder and I turned my head and that someone said, sir, Give me, please, uh, the, this engraving, this etching by um, Charles Marion. I'll give you $500 and you can keep uh, for free the one by Rembrandt. And I laughed at him. I said, you must be crazy. I'm not interested. You can have for $500 Rembrandt, which I know is a forgery. Anyway, he left. So very happily, I, I went uh, the next day uh, to... to uh, a seller of engravings, uh, how do you call them, a uh, dealer that I knew. And I uh, I said to him, uh, you know, I, I was mimicking that I'm not pressed by financial issues. I told him, I said, uh, you know, I might have uh, uh, something to sell. Uh, he said, what? I said, La Psy de Notre Dame by Charles Marion. And immediately, immediately he started to tremble. He said, you have this? I said, yes, I think it's by him. I, I, you know, I was playing the, the fool. Do you have it with you? I said, yes, I have it with me. Show it to me immediately. So I, I take it out from my bag. I show it to him. And uh, he said, do you sell it? And of course, I, I was playing hard to get. I told him, uh, I'm not really pressed by money problems. I just wanted to show it. He said, sell it to me. I'll, I'll give you $2,000 for it right now. But I knew it, well, it, 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 its value was higher. And I said, no, 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 I, I'm not in a hurry. 2,500. I said, no, 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 really. 3,000, the last price. Well, when I heard this, you know, as, as I said, I was hungry. I, I borrowed money. I had no money. I said, okay, if you insist, okay. Uh, okay, you can have it. I gave him the etching. He gave me a check with $3,000. I left like a man possessed. Uh, his uh, office and I was going to the subway station in New York at 86th Street and I didn't even see, I mean I saw but I ignored the lady with a huge dog they were coming towards me and uh, I was flying high, I mean I had a check for $3,000 in my hand and you know uh, I was hungry as I said so I, I felt very, very immensely rich so the, the then God entered into me and I entered into the God. I fell to the ground. They passed by me, the lady with the dog. But it was a huge dog, really. I, I, I hurt myself in the, in the knee. Some blood came out of one of my knees. But I didn't care. I still had the, the check in my hand. I was holding it tight. So I take the subway. I go home. I was living in Brooklyn. When I arrive home, uh, there was a message on the answering machine because at that time was with answering machines. Uh, a voice there, it was the dealer. Mr. Koma, if you are so kind, you know, I, I'm afraid uh, your etching is, 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 uh, is fake. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not real. Uh, so please be kind if you can to, to return me the money. And because I try to be an honest man, although I was very saddened, I changed my pants because I broke them when I fell. I took the subway back. I arrive at his door. I give him the check and he gives me the etching back. But when I look at it, there was a, 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 something changed here around this spot here near these clouds, like a, a, 
a spot of, di of, of dirt and a little bit wrinkled the paper. And I said, excuse me, but that's not how, how my etching was when I gave it to you. Uh, he said, sorry, you know, maybe in my hurry, uh, in, in a hurry, I, maybe I, I wrinkled it. I, it's okay, he said, you can, uh, you can restore it with 100 dollars. I said, you know, I didn't damage it. You damaged it. You pay for the restoring it, not me. He said, okay, I'll do this for you. So one week later, I go back to him. He gives me back the etching. It was still with the, it was still perceivable that damage. A little bit, a little bit better, but just a little bit better. So I didn't get any money. I got back the etching. I went with it to the New York Public Library, the section of with, um, you know, where you can actually see, or if we can say so, original engravings, Dürer, you name it, uh, Charles Marion, and so on. I confronted mine with, with the one the library had, and they were identical. Only years later, and this is to show you how naive I am, only years later, many years later, someone told me, you know, you know he said, damn, what if uh, the dealer replaced your etching with an etching he had, which was damaged and which he couldn't sell because it was damaged? It never crossed my mind, but I think this is what happened. And I still have this in the attic in Sibiu somewhere. I don't know where it is. This is the story with Charles Marion, L'Apsie de Notre Dame, because this is how it is called, this famous... Uh, um, you know, uh, engraving or graphic work or etching that uh, Charles Marion did. Yeah. New projects for the spire and roof of Notre Dame. Uh, you probably know some of them. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what they will do in the end. Uh, so the damage, as you know, was done here exactly where Viol Violet Le Duc was. The roof and the spire, the spire built by Violet Le Duc uh, collapsed. Statues removed before fire because there was some work being done there. So I guess uh, Monsieur Violet Le Duc was removed before the fire uh, uh, started. Uh, so this is the west elevation of Notre Dame uh, it was not affected by the fire and then the roof and uh, you know there was a competition there were all kinds of proposals of course it was sir norman foster couldn't miss the the you know the the occasion to make a project himself that's how that's how the situation was you know truly a, a big a big a big uh, you know tragedy a big a big uh, accident um, and this was a proposal which I find uh, truly uh, unacceptable. Um, another one here, you know, people propose all kinds of things, you know, but it's not so easy, actually. Um, of course, you can do lots of things, but maybe even the extravagant uh, thought of the wife of the president of, uh, of uh, France, uh, Madame Macron. You know, I mean, you make on top of, uh, of Notre Dame something again, not for God, for, but for man, because what else do we see on the right here? You know, it's because we he be, live in a desacralized world and man thinks still that he, he is the measure of all things. And, uh, you know, uh, lots of glass. Of course, there you need air, air conditioning because otherwise you would suffocate with so much glass right there, exposed to the sun. Uh, I really feel that sometimes um, Frank Lloyd Wright was uh, right when he said, nothing wrong with architecture except the architects. <laughs> Another, I don't, I hesitate to use the, the first word that came to my mind from, from the side of the architect. Uh, and even, you know, they imagined all kinds of things, but in my opinion, until now, from what I saw here, nothing really works. Uh, even a swimming pool on top of the Notre Dame de Paris. 
welcome to the present, welcome to the 21st century. But this is not very dissimilar from what Leon Krier proposed uh, a good number of years ago when he imagined a triangular swimming pool, large public swimming pool in front of uh, um, San Pietro in, uh, in, in Rome. Uh, here we have, uh, we have the culmination of the age of Anthropocene, right? Man taking over. Could you imagine something like this in the Middle Ages? Impossible. I mean, absolutely impossible. This would have been totally sacrilegious. But this is the impertinence of a contemporary man. Let's swim on top of the Notre Dame, right? Sir Norman Foster. Hello, Mr. Foster. Here he is. At least he has some, I don't know if he's decency, but, you know, nothing truly special. Sir Norman Foster is an architect a little bit predictable, but he doesn't make big mistakes. Only rarely he does. A glass roof would allow natural light to illuminate the space below. Thanks, Mr. Foster. If you didn't tell us, you, we, would, we would have never thought of this. It's ridiculous. New spire made from crystal glass and stainless steel. Glass, glass, and glass again. You know, do we know of anything else, really? I mean, these people in the, in the Middle Ages built in stone. Um, they had uh, Rosetta, the rose, in, you know, in, uh, in, in glass, and they had uh, stained glass windows, but they were windows. But, uh, that's all we can do. Glass, glass, and glass again. Massimiliano Fuxas studio. Here he is, of course, in front of the cathedral, rather rather intensely uh, looking uh, to the right. Uh, what did he propose? Uh, this is what he proposed. Uh, not very different from Sir Norman Foster, right? I mean, I'm sorry to say it, you know, we are talking about major architects today, but when it comes to the sacred, and at the level, at this level, you know, one of the famous cathedrals of the world coming to us from, uh, you know, a lot of uh, centuries ago, I think uh, contemporary architects are, are rather unable to cope with the complexity and with the responsibility of the task. I think they are overwhelmed. And they show, because again, the Gothic was built by a collectivity, by a society together. While here we are dealing with individualism, we, we see Mr. Fuxas, we see Mr. Foster, but, but these cathedrals were not built by individuals. They were built by a collective. It was a collective work. And it, it, you know, the, the individuals that composed that collective were anonymous. But this is not the case today. Now we go to Basilica de Saint Denis, uh, west facade, uh, and I can I, I don't believe it. I went to students from from Minku, uh, and we we lived very close to, to 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 this very important building, and we didn't go to to visit it. It's just unacceptable. Um, and but but if you want to travel to Paris, please, if you want talk with me because I know a great Airbnb, um, Airbnb or how it is called, uh, place very close to Basilica Saint Denis where Viollet le Duc, as I said, did the uh, restoration of the, of the Western facade. And um, again, this building apparently is considered the first Gothic building. And that's where you can find the, you know, the tombs, um, the gravestones of the, of the kings of France. They are buried here in this cathedral, in this basilica, Saint Denis. Ah, I wish I could go back to to uh, to, to Paris again and, and 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 go straight to this basilica, but live in the same place. I I love I love that place, and it was not expensive. Um, and anyway, in between the basilica and the place where we live, there were. Uh, you know, people from Africa selling uh, delicious food, uh, you know, with one euro, euro you would buy, uh, I don't know how it was called, it, it had a special name, uh, very enjoyable, <clears throat> right in front of the subway station. 
Anyway, Saint Denis, where the kings of France are for the Domus Eterna. It was supposed to be like this, but uh, you see, it's only the tower of the right built. The other one, for some reason, uh, I don't know, maybe it had at the very beginning two uh, spires, but now it's only one. Uh, and say, uh, <laughs> Uh, he loved himself. He he was in love with himself, Viola Le Duc, and he represented himself again here. <laughs> so the, the building uh, was supposed to be like, uh, is on the left. Mont Saint-Michel, another formidable uh, touristic attraction in France. Um, I guess he was a specialist in spires, but not only spires. Metallic as they are. Uh, he probably did many things, you know, with, the, the, these restorations are uh, complicated. It's hard. I mean, I'm sure the specialists know exactly what Viola Le Duc did. I don't. I love the Gothic. I love citadels. I'm made in Sibiu, Carcassonne. Well, here again, the power of walls, 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 but not in, in the sense that uh, Pink Floyd uh, talked about the wall. Somehow in the Middle Ages, the, the wall seemed right. Also, I am suggesting to you, students in architecture and architects, to think of a different urba, urban culture, urbanism. You know, because the medieval urbanism was so different from our urbanism. You know, they, they, they were in closed cities, introverted in a way. That's why they are so charming, actually. You go to Italy, to a medieval town, uh, what could be more enjoyable? No cars usually on the street or not too many, no highways. Plus the feeling of uh, being protected by the walls that surround the city. We don't have that any longer. We have suburbs. We have, uh, you know, uh, highway, uh, highway that encircles the city. But it's, it's a very different feeling. And I, 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 my intuition is that if we are to survive on this earth, we'll go back to some suggestions coming, coming from the Middle Ages. Maybe smaller cities, maybe conceived in this way, you know, like uh, um, ideal cities in a way introverted uh, uh, with narrow streets with of course we have we have we have cars and we need parkings and we we need all all that paraphernalia of uh, means necessary to employ in order to make the car run 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 but maybe we don't need so much running any longer at one point Eugène Violet Le Duc La Cité de Carcassonne Plus, enjoyable also is the very irregular, uh, you know, uh, perimeter line that the, all medieval cities have this. But the modern cities are not like this. Try to compare this, for example, with Cité Radieuse by Le Corbusier. But in the case of Le Corbusier, we shouldn't be surprised. If you check on the, on the, on the internet images with the city where Le Corbusier was born, you'll understand why he proposed that uh, rather disastrous uh, uh, Ville Radieuse, so-called Radieuse. It was almost identical in spirit, very, you know, to say that it was Cartesian is not, it's not enough, actually. It's, um, I'm absolutely sure that as I was formed by living in Sibiu, uh, uh, Le Corbusier was, was formed by living in his uh, very bizarre city in Switzerland. Uh, ah, the drawing by, uh, look, look, that's what uh, Violet Le Duc, did, uh, Violet Le Duc uh, did, you know, he envisioned everything, but he, he envisioned not just the building, but also the life and the raison d'etre of the building. You know, we see a lot of activity going on there, no? It's a city within a city. I would play to live in something like this. Cathedral de Clermont-Ferrand. Uh, I don't know what he did here, but this is the, this cathedral, uh, Viollet-le-Duc. 
an inspiring figure, no doubt. And uh, again, the richness of France is incredible. I mean, these cathedrals, uh, you know, just in themselves are uh, immense riches. Well, today is not like this any longer, of course. You know, now the, the, the office building by man, of man, for man, is taller, much taller than the cathedral. So, you know, man won the battle with God, so to speak. So I was once on in New York on Fifth Avenue, and it was around 3 p.m. or so, and I turned my head for some reason, and I saw... It was right in front, having in the background the Empire State Building. It was the, the silhouette of a little church. And I regret I didn't have a camera. It was right in front, in front of, I mean, there was a distance between the church and the Empire State Building. But it happened that from the point where I was seeing them, they were superimposed. The church was in front. But very small, and the Empire State Building huge, and I think that represented, in a way, symbolized the relationship between man and God. Now, man, man went far away, upwards, and 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 uh, and the church, you know, became less and less uh, significant, less and less, uh, less and less, uh, less and less. Uh, um, in a way, even uh, necessary, it seems. Eglise Saint Nicolas, the Mister Moselle, another church with two tall uh, um, towers. Cathedral Notre Dame, Dame de Lausanne, uh, a drawing, Viollet le Duc. When did he have time to make all these works? Not just uh, construction work, but also these graphic works. He didn't have Revit. He didn't have uh, what we have. And yet, Basilique Saint-Cernet de Semnin de, Toulou de Toulouse, uh, rather unusual. Uh, what is it called? Basilica, Basilique Saint-Cernin de Toulouse. But what exactly he did here again, I, I don't know. He worked on the building. Apartment building. Now, finally, we come down to earth. Um, and I think he lived in one of these buildings. Uh, yes, he lived here. L'architecte Eugène Violet Le Duc a construit cette maison on, uh, on uh, in 1862 uh, jusqu'à la fin de sa vie so he, uh, he he lived in this building in 1862 until he died in 1879 so for uh, 17 years he lived in this building and where do you think he lived right here uh, why do I identify so easily? Because it is here, I think, is an owl uh, sculpted at the top. And is the only place, you know, identifiable in this way on the whole facade. So Violet Le Duc, also the windows, you see, are a little different. So I guess his apartment was all this, uh, maybe longer. That's where Violet Le Duc lived in Paris, in a building he himself built. Here it is. Here it is. Maybe his studio was here, and it looks more like, a, you know, with more glass and more light. And perhaps, yes, it was his studio here. Maybe the whole apartment was his. So don't forget when you are in Paris, um, um, go and see this building where Violet Le Duc uh, lived. Now the the uh, old. O W L symbolizes um, symb symbolizes wisdom. Now, is is it an owl really? <laughs> I with my uh, inadequate glasses, uh, I'm not so sure. But I think it is. It's supposed to be. But also, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a museum now here. I wish I had this uh, studio for myself. 
you know, to enjoy going to Paris and, you know, dream here and draw on the floor like B.R.K. Ingels and uh, make, uh, yes, it's, it is an hour. Hello, hello, how are you? Do you see your master where he is now? <laughs> In a way, it's true. Art, arts longa vita brevis. Life is short, art is long. You see, the owl survived. Uh, the master survived Viollet le Duc. Viollet le Duc died in 1867, or I forgot, 1817 something, 1876, 1867, I think, yes. Uh, this is his room. Uh, in, it's probably a museum. Another immeuble. Uh, <clears throat> also built by him, so he didn't build just uh, reconstructed churches, but he did some apartment buildings in, in, in Paris as well. But these are not so easily identifiable because of the, you know, the similarity between uh, the blocks of flats in, in, in Paris. Another one. No, this is the one where he lived. And I see there are, well, archives here, maybe related to Violet Le Duc, but that's the building where he, he lived. Another one. He didn't live here. Anyway, apartments, blocks of flats, other images, other works, the construction, what is this? Um, Restoration, Saint-Chapelle de Paris. I mean, you know, I'm beginning to be disappointed by my presentation because he himself uh, deserves more than just, uh, you know, half an hour or 45 minutes or even one hour. But we still thought of him now that um, we are on the uh, 28th of, uh, of, of January. Houses, castles, forests, gardens, parks, chateaus. France is immensely rich. La Belle France. Although, some, as I said, some people hate Viola Le Duc, but I don't think they are right. He was totally dedicated to art and architecture, to architecture and art and culture and uh, I'm sure he worked very hard. Uh, these are just restorations, uh, these last images of, of this presentation. And then we'll go to Felix Candela. So this is a superficial, quick, uh, little bit of, uh, you know, tour of France. But the gargoyles of Violet Le Duc are remarkable. And I, I love, in general, gargoyles. Let's look a few uh, made by him. Violet Le Duc, the gargoyles, here they are. Here is one of them. Maybe some kind of an alter ego or some kind of a self-portrait here as well. It's possible. And I keep suggesting to you, the students, and to you, architects, Incorporate in your work even such things, you know, even if you don't build a cathedral, you know, do something somewhere in an attic or in a room. I don't know, something, think of something, narrate something. Here is another one, you know, staring at the city of lights. Now, why would this architect, um, you know, uh, propose even something like this for the cathedral? They are famous. And I look at these, uh, you know, monsters, these animals, but, but somehow I feel that they are, they, uh, they express something from the human psychology. I wonder what he thought of, of, of his gar gargoyles. Drawings done by him because they were executed on, on based on his drawings. 
Tour Montparnasse here in, in the background. Viollet le Duc. I wonder what makes make what these figures make you think of. There was terror, there was fear, there was uh, puzzlement in front of, uh, you know, the mystery of life. But somehow, I think the quest for beauty is inevitably accompanied by this terror, this feeling that, I mean, here we have uh, Tour Eiffel, and here we have the gargoyle of Viollet le Duc. Uh, you know... We can speculate a little bit. We can philosophize about, about these two poles somehow. I think they are very moving. And here he is. And the spire of Notre Dame de Paris, which fell, and that's it. So now we go to the second, uh, uh, I would say architect that we'll talk about today, and that is Felix Candela, a remarkable, remarkable engineer who deserves to be called an architect, and he was an architect. So Felix Candela, he lived longer than Viollet le Duc, 1910, 1997. Uh, so Felix Candela Uterino, he was a Spanish, was a Spanish and Mexican architect, was born in Madrid and at the age of 26, as you see, he was born on January 10, 27th, that was yesterday, emigrated to Mexico, acquiring double nationality. He is known for his significant role in the development of Mexican architecture and structural engineer, engineering. Candela's major contribution to architecture was the development of thin shells made out of reinforced concrete, popularly known as cascarons. He was one of Santiago Calatrava's teachers and has had a great influence on his works. So let's remember this. Felix Candela was uh, one of Calatrava's teachers, and I, say, I think they even had some kind of a you know, personal relationship, friendship. I think I have an image here of them together. This was the architect, he, Spanish himself, smoking, smoking, like many creative people before him and, you know, during his time. Today, very few people still smoke. Uh, maybe the, the cigarettes are more uh, uh, dangerous these days, maybe. Drawings, some drawings of this engineer turned architect uh, he was an artist, of course, he was a poet. I mean, he searched, he quested for beauty. You know, he was not one of those engineers who just uh, wanted quickly to finish the job, the quicker, the better, the easier way, the better, and go home and watch a stupid film from Netflix or uh, Hollywood. No, he was an engineer who loved engineering. And in a way, I think all great artists and writers and musicians and uh, poets and architects in a certain way, to put it bluntly, search for God, just like Viola Le Duc did, and just as Felix Candela did, in his own way. And you'll see a church built by Felix Candela, which is formidable. Formidable. And look at this drawing. It's pure engineering, and at the same time, it's astonishingly architectural. A structure and beauty become one. Felix Candela, a Spaniard who lived and worked in Mexico. Mexico. The Pavilion of Cosmic Rays, 1951, National Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, it's a pavilion. Now, let's say again, 1951, uh, with a flamboyant name, Pavilion of Cosmic Rays. <laughs> Who would uh, use such names these days? Maybe very few people. Uh, for a university, he worked probably with an architect, this person, Reina, but I'm sure his role was, was significant here. 
you see you have structure but you also have aesthetics you know that the structure becomes also so to speak ornamental because it's it's about beauty in the end it's not just structure it does its role is not only to make the building stand it's also to to make it beautiful or to make it appealing Felix Candela. It's logical and at the same time it, it escapes the predictability of logic because it becomes an aesthetical uh, uh, you know achievement. Warehouses, 1952 in Mexico City. Now look at this. When you look at it, would you say it's a warehouse? No way. When we think of a warehouse, what could be more prosaic than a wa warehouse? Well, this is not prosaic at all. It's poetical. It flies, that roof flies. Thin shells of concrete. And he was famous for it, you know. Of course, an architect would draw them and have the intuition of them, but this man also did the measurements, the calculations. So it wouldn't fall. He was the engineer. That is very, you know, it's very noble and it's 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 almost lyrical in its, uh, you know, in its purity. The warehouse. This is an artwork. <laughs> Now this church from 1953, sorry, a one is missing to 1957, Iglesia de la Medalla de la Virgin Milagrosa in, in Mexico City again, Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal Church. So we show, we saw restorations by Viola Le Duc. Now we see um, church by uh, uh, this uh, very important engineer, Felix Candela. Already from the outside, you have the feeling that something is happening here. And uh, is, the inside is very moving. There are some um, images that I saw that are almost uh, almost surreal. Uh, even the bell tower. And you see, it's, it's the work. I think he worked alone here as a, as a um, yeah, no one else is mentioned. So he, I think he did everything. The, the structure, the structural work, and also the architectural work. They were one, actually. Um, the the image that I chose for the the announcement for the presentation was taken from this church, and that image, I wasn't sure if it was a you know a, a photograph or it was some kind of a you know a rendering uh, because of its uh, surreality. I mean, look at the look at those columns that support the the, the arches, and uh, I mean it's it's art. Felix Candela. Uh, he contradicts what Walter Gropius said, because Walter Gropius, the founder of the Bauhaus, said that uh, um, architecture begins where um, engineering ends. It's not true. Uh, this is an example, because it is the work of an engineer. And we cannot say it's not architectural. It is. And look at this interior. I think it's sublime. It's almost like a stage design for a Gothic or neo-Gothic movie. You know, it's... But it's real. It's a built work in concrete. Done without computers. At that time, the computer didn't yet arrive in, in on the drafting boards of the of the architects or engineers it's remarkable felix candela a church in mexico city that mexico city which uh, you know a president like uh, trump considered a vicious place together with the whole country and that's why he wanted to separate them with a thick and tall wall 
But I had been uh, for uh, a week or two in, in uh, at least in Acapulco City, and I have to tell you, uh, it's an old culture with very proud people, and some of them are very well educated. And beyond this, I have to tell you, the Mexicans dance like crazy. I never saw all my life, and I'm not an expert, no, in this at all. But I did go one evening to a, I was depressed, I was alone, and I went to a discotheque, and I had, a, I received a lesson of vivacity, which I will never forget. Two Mexicans danced like they were snakes. I never saw my whole life something like this. I mean, that kind of movement and energy, unbelievable. So, and they have great architects, the Mexicans, and not just the architects. It's a very interesting country. So this is some kind of a, I mean, this reminds me of the stage design for the film by Hans Pelzig, an expressionist German architect. Because this is like, almost like, yes, like a stage design for a film, maybe a horror film, a Fright Night movie, you know. Uh, and, 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 and it's not, it's, 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 it's a real building made in concrete. The, the architectural expression is obvious for all to see. Very powerful and mysterious. It's about attaining an expressive interior space a surrounding sculpture that one admires from the inside. But this sculpture cannot be capricious and arbitrary since one has to respond to the external laws of structural equilibrium. This is what Felix Candela said. And yes, he was an engineer, but he talked about the building as a sculpture. Thus, he talked about it in terms almost identical with those used by Constantin Brancusi, who was a sculptor, and who said the building is an inhabitable sculpture. And he talked about expression, the expressive interior space, a surrounding sculpture that one admires from the inside. The peculiar quality of the church, this is someone else who wrote Colin Faber, the peculiar quality of the church, of this church that we looked at, resides in the fact that it was a highly individualistic architectural statement, but one such as could never have been <clears throat> conceived or at least executed by a contemporary architect. For it was first of all an engineering play of great sophistication. I never witnessed an indifferent reaction to it. Its effect was such that almost overnight, as it seemed, Candela became known as the le leading practitioner of, a, of shell design in the world. And indeed he was. This is what happens when you aspire towards excellence. You know, when you give your life to making steps towards excellence, to achieve your highest potential, Wonders can happen. There is calculation, but there is also expression which transcends calculation. I think even Violello Duke would have liked it very much with all his sophisticated and very deep knowledge of the Gothic. But you see, he's not mimicking the Gothic. This is a modern creation, a contemporary creation. I mean, it was done you know, some years ago, but it's still contemporary because good art and good architecture do not age, actually. That's what I meant and mean when I say that, you know, the, uh, the past that counts does not pass. It's pure, it's dark, it's complicated in a way. It's simple at the same time. It's, I wouldn't call it Apollonia, no, because there is darkness, there are shadows here. It's Gothic in spirit. Uh, it's a pure work. 
maybe he created those lamps too. It's possible because they seem to be in the spirit of the building. The plan is not so impressive. When you look at the plan, you say, if you don't see the section, the vertical section, you say, what is this a banal building? But when you look at the, at the space inside, it's, it's something altogether different. So the, the plan can be deceiving. I mean, even the diagrammatic section or elevation is, is still not telling you the, the, whole, the whole story. Now, uh, an industrial building, 1954-1955, again, uh, you know, the purity of structure, a structure which became aesthetical, There is some complexity here as well, despite the modules and the repetition. Uh, what is this? The stock exchange, the covering for um, Rocky. Anyway, uh, 1955. Look what he did. This is inside the stock exchange. Uh, but all of a sudden, a space which would have been otherwise maybe not very impressive became special. Why? Because of the power of expression. And it is a calculated expression, so to speak, because, because this engineer built in order, in, I mean, imagined in order to, to build. And this was a measurable uh, enterprise. But the, the beauty of the structure and the purity of the structure uh, is not difficult to perceive. And I keep saying to myself and to others and to you, architecture is beautiful if it is an adventure. If it is not an adventure, if you don't discover anything, if you don't bring in the new, something special, something which is you, yours, well, you know, you build it, but without it, the earth would have been the same. What is this? Something for music in Santa Fe. And look at this. I mean, it's a, it's a canopy over a, a stage where probably a band performs, you know, in open air. But I think it's very impressive because it looks very heavy and it just springs from that uh, part that is attached to, 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 to the earth. And I find it, you know, immensely uh, uh, moving and provocative, uh, almost like a sculpture. Now, of course, he was lucky. He had, uh, he had uh, the, the training and the knowledge to calculate this, to make it happen. And at the same time, he had the desire for expression. As Louis Kahn would have said and did say, spirit in will to express can make the great sun seem small. The spirit in will to express can make the great sun seem small. And I think... This spirit animated Felix Candela too. It's just a canopy above a stage, not a big deal. But it's, it's an artwork and it's an architectural work. It's sculpture, it's architecture, it's engineering, it's everything. Now, I'm sure he didn't do that graffiti there and he didn't intend it, but, but that graffiti doesn't affect the, the feeling that I, I get when I look at it at all. So, Yes, it is in a state of neglect, but it, it stands and it stands gloriously, almost, almost, almost uh, uh, defying uh, gravity. I like it very much. It's almost a tr triumph of the human spirit. It's abstract, it's organic, it's flying, it stands, it, 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 it is face the earth and the sky at the same time. It's an aspiration. It also prote protects the people underneath, but not too much. It's very beautiful, I think. This is another one. 
or is it the same one? Maybe it's the same one. And let's look again. Is, yeah, I think it's the same one. As you can see, there are engineers and engineers. A good engineer is himself an artist or wants to be an artist. Those who are just uh, happy to have a, 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 an easy job adding and subtracting numbers, they, they are irrelevant to the art of construction. So he built these churches. He built several churches in Mexico. Uh, you read them here, you know. It's... This one, El Atiro Church in Cayoacan. Okay, it's, it's okay. It's, you know, not too dissimilar from a church built in Wisconsin by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, less exalted than the one by, by Wright, it's true. But he tried. Another one. Tacuba, this one is uh, rather interesting, but I, I, I hate that this picture, its resolution is not great. Uh, we have a better one from the inside. Yes, at times you can still see that he was an engineer, but was an engineer who tried also to infuse aesthetics into his engineering work. And I think he succeeded uh, in, in some works better than, other, than in others. Uh, he was a creator, uh, that's clear. Felix Candela, another one, 1963. In a way, Felix Candela was just like uh, the acrobat in uh, Le Corbusier's poem, no? who is risking his life, you know, in order to achieve the unachievable, to, to do what others cannot do. Uh, he tried to make all this heavy, you know, volumes and surfaces and uh, these uh, parts of buildings almost fly, you know. And, 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 and it was a quest for uh, um, arriving at the unknown and at the unmeasurable, but through measurableness, because that was his job as an engineer. But he, in a way, his goal was not very different from uh, Brincusi's uh, goal when he sculpted 27 birds. He was searching for, towards escaping the determinism of, of gravity and uh, the weight of a life without, uh, uh, you know, the, the advantages that the bird has. Felix Candela. <laughs> it's kind of funny that this nun has her, you know, uh, uh, cap or uh, I don't know how to call it, kind of uh, similar to the to the building by Felix Candela, as you can see in this picture. She stares at the building, and the building stares back at her, at, at her. Again and again, architecture is beautiful when it is creative. When it, when it is not creative, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a sad story and a dull affair and a, a very uh, tedious, uh, uh, you know, activity. It has to be creative in whatever form. Another one, Santa Monica Lopez of Carmona. I think he designed even a supermarket or so. In fact, this is, I'm not sure, this is a church, it is. Uh, this one also has beautiful things. Like, look at this, look at this column here. It's like the trunk of a tree and it's, it is slanted, it's not perpendicular on the floor. It's magnificent. It is magnificent, you know, and, 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 and you know, I, I hope I remember to talk about it a little bit when it's the Diagonal Festival on the 26th of February, because that's exactly what I had in mind. You know, why? what made him do this column in this way? 
why didn't he make it straight, you know, perpendicular on the floor? It's, it's the otherness of God. And it is the otherness of the true artist and the true writer and the true poet and the true architect and the true engineer. The otherness. Yeah, that's what it is. And, but also maybe, I mean, you know, the, the theologian might say, wait a minute, you know, this, this puts uh, Christ on the cross in a peculiar position. It's almost like a questioning. No, if it is a questioning, I think it is a questioning of, uh, of dogmas and it's a questioning of uh, those who uh, claim that there is no suffering in the world when in fact that very Christ on the cross represented the ultimate suffering. So the suffering of the slanted column is testifying actually about the suffering of Christ on the cross. A market this time, not a church, but a market from around that time. Vegetables, fruits, uh, bananas, uh, potatoes, uh, whatever. A market. But above the fruits and the vegetables, we see the work of a brilliant engineer. I love it. On the floor, I mean, uh, closer to the, to the floor, you know, the, the fruits of nature and agriculture. And above the fruits of the mind and the uh, hardworking uh, uh, calculations of, of man. That's how it looks without, uh, you know, the colorful uh, presence of uh, what nature gives us. Uh, both ways I like. I like it this way, maybe even more. And here is architecture without life in a way. And here is architecture plus life. Nice. This is another market, I think. Uh, sorry, I, I don't have very relevant pictures. It's okay. The purity of the thought of the engineer is still shown for those who are, uh, have an eye to see and an interest to see. You know, uh, the prose of life, which is itself poetical and nice, is, uh, you know, on the, closer to the earth. Uh, and then above is, is, is the work of the mind, the abstractness, the abstraction of the work of someone who was not happy to just uh, put a flat roof above, uh, above the whole thing. No. A nightclub in Acapulco, since I mentioned Acapulco, 1956-1957. Well, here I'm more impressed about what's behind the, 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 the canopy in uh, thin shell of concrete that uh, Felix Candela built. But uh, the work uh, of the engineer is good too. Born on the 27th of January, yes. Maybe Viola Le Duc knows uh, Felix Candela and Felix Candela knows Viola Le Duc. Maybe, maybe they have a chat today, wherever they are, and they say, do you see those people in Bucharest? You know, uh, they talk about us, Viola. What do you think about it? And Viola answers, yes, Felix, you are right. People still remember us. Of course we remember them and we have to remember them and it is not just a sacred duty because it, we get insp inspiration from, from them. We really do. I do and I hope you do too. Uh, this is a restaurant, but uh, you know, a nightclub, a restaurant, no, put tables and so on, but the architecture still says a big yes to the sky, to imagination, to human uh, brilliance. Uh, another restaurant for the for the tourists. What can we do? We need the tourists we, because we need the money, uh, and that's what it is. Felix Candela, thin shells, and the constructors, those who built it. 
thin, thin, but very strong. You know, those people are on top of the structure, but the structure is stubbornly carrying them like an obedient camel. A chapel, Felix Candela. I truly believe that Felix Candela from Spain serves for God just as Viollet le Duc from France did in, in their own ways, one in the 19th century, the other one in the 20th century. Uh, factory. Why does a factory have to look like a factory? It can look like something else, and this one does look like something else. If you see it, you don't think it's a factory. That's where the brilliance of uh, creative work comes in. Imagine yourself working in such a so-called factory. You'd be enlightened, you'd be inspired by the beauty of the structure. And <laughs> obviously he knew what he was doing, wasn't he? I mean, this reminds me of a similar testing that um, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, uh, initiated for one of his works for the um, columns of uh, uh, Johnson Wax uh, complex of buildings. But here, it's amazing, no? Uh, look how thin it is and look how many people are on top of it. You can count them, there are more than 20. Another church. He built many churches, this engineer. They all seem to fly, or almost all. I think engineers in general are more pure than architects. Sorry for saying this, but I remember what, uh, what uh, Le Corbusier said. Le Corbusier said, I love painters and engineers, but I don't love architects. Aula Magna, this uh, Mexican foundation, no picture, another church. Where is this in Mexico? Felix Candela. For the Summer Olympics, 1968, a stadium. 
We are approaching the end of this presentation. Very interesting during construction as well, as it should be. I think I have a picture with him and Calatrava, probably at the very end, his student, teacher and student together. I don't know what that futuristic uh, car is. I don't think he designed the car. He designed just the building. Metro stations in Mexico City, San Lazaro. Sorry about the, the resolution. Uh, some of these subway stations could have been uh, almost easily, you know, churches and chapels, Candelaria. Uh, this is another subway station and look at the inside is uh, inspiring. Valencia, Spain, 1994-2002. Uh, when did he die? Uh, so in Valencia, we know that, uh, I mean, Spain has, uh, has its uh, heritage. So he came back, this happens, you know, people come back, return to their roots. Uh, this form, this shape is a little predictable. He did several things like this. So not everything is, um, you know, uh, astonishingly new. And here they are. Uh, you know, Candela in his older age with uh, the young uh, engineer uh, Santiago Calatrava. When you work with love, with passion, when you do creative things, as I said, you forget to eat. It doesn't matter, actually, if, if you eat and if you eat what you eat. It doesn't really matter. That's it. So let's wish him happy birthday. And that, that was it today. Thank you for being here.